Go live. Instagram is on right now. So. Instagram's on. All right. Is everybody there? Are you live? Are we live? We are live. We are live. All right. Thanks for uh, signing in, everybody that uh, registered on our website and came to view this uh, first uh, first time virtual hand pan class. So really happy that you're joining us. Um, first thing I want to talk about is subscribing to our YouTube channel. So if we're going to do more of these, which I think we are, because we're in that kind of generation right now, or we got to do everything online. So let me just show you really quick uh, how to subscribe to our channel. So I'm going to go to Trevor Noah's channel right now because his stuff is hilarious. Uh, and what you want to do is you go to YouTube, go to the little uh, thing where you search, and you're not going to search for Trevor Noah. You're going to search for Dave's Island Instruments. I can't do it online because I'm already subscribed to mine. But uh, let's see this, how this works. So Trevor Noah's right there. You see a little red uh, word that says subscribe. So what you're going to do is you're going to click on that really right there. And then it says you subscribe. So now I'm subscribed. It's not red anymore. Uh, but then what you want to do is you want to click that little bell that's next to the subscribe button. And you can uh, allow it to give you notifications. You can say all. So if you have all, what happens is I think you get these little notifications on your uh, on your phone whenever we uh, post something new or whenever we have a live event. So go ahead and do that now. Search for Dave's Island Instruments and subscribe to our channel. You'll be happy you did because we're going to be having a lot of different events coming up. Um, so thank you very much for subscribing. All right, this is a beginning hand pan class. Oh, let me put these over here. Uh, for mostly beginners and for intermediates, um, if you've already uh, done one of our hand pan classes here at Lakewood in our store, uh, it's going to be a great review for you and to keep you playing. Um, so most of you are probably at home, uh, uh, sequestering yourselves and keeping yourselves uh, at home. Uh, so this is something fun to do while you're at home. Um, obviously, one of the things that's most attractive about the hand pan is it's a really great tool to relax and meditate to. So uh, if you just learn the basics of how to play the instrument, um, you can immediately start to just enjoy yourself. Um, and that's kind of what we want to do with this class. We want to just get you started and um, knowing the basics so that you can enjoy the, enjoy the instrument with uh, yourself and with your family or with your friends if they come over. <laughs> Social distancing. All right. Um, if you don't have a hand pan, um, then I just want to let you know that we do rent hand pans here at DII. You can log on to our website. Our website is www.davesislandinstruments.com. Uh, you can go find the rentals there. You can search for them. Um, we also have our, our events page on our website, and you can uh, find out when we're going to be having more of these live events on our uh, website events page. Uh, basically, that's davesislandinstruments.com slash events. Really easy. Um, and you can register for those so we know how many people to expect and uh, who's going to be watching. So uh, they'll be good for you to do that. Um, like I said, if you don't have a hand pan, um, uh, even today, uh, you can watch and learn a little bit as you progress, uh, and I think it will help you in the future if you get a handpan of your own. Also, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the different handpans that we have to offer here at DII so you can see what the differences are. Um, before we get started, I want to know a little bit about you. So, if you are logged in, uh, maybe you can just send us a quick comment um, that says, Hey, I'm uh, Julie, I'm from Arizona, something like that. Um, like maybe you could say I'm a novice or I don't have a hand pan or I do have a hand pan. Um, Carrie's on the line. She's working virtually right now, checking the comments. Um, so if you make a comment, um, I can hear them and we'll maybe get back to you um, in a little bit after we uh, read through the comments. Um, so it'd be great to get to know you a little bit. I must admit it's a little bit awkward talking to a camera. So <laughs> it's not like my normal class. I love having my normal classes. I'm surrounded by people. It's one of the things I absolutely adore uh, about this store is I can just have people come in. They're right next to me. Um, it's a really warm feeling and I love it. Uh, so I'm going to do my best with this camera right in front of me, but I'm going to imagine that you're right there. So it helps me if I know who's behind that camera uh, and I think it'll be really fun for you and for me. We can create a relationship together. Uh, so that'll be great. Questions, chat with us live. All right, so um, first things first. Um, let me tell you a little bit about me first, about we even get into the hand pan. I don't want to delay it too much. I'm just going to give you a quick review. Uh, my name is David Beery. I'm the owner of Dave's Island Instruments. Uh, I, was, uh, I had a previous a business called Smarty Pans, and in that previous business I was making steel drums. Uh, steel drums are Caribbean instruments from the, from the island of Trinidad. 
and I learned how to do that in the early 1990s. And so I've been tuning uh, steel drums and now hand pans for uh, upwards of 25, 30 years. Uh, so I think I tuned my first steel drum and or first uh, attempted to make a steel drum in 1991. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, so all through the 1990s, I was uh, making and tuning steel drums. I was working at North High School and other schools around the area, um, teaching them how to play uh, steel drums and steel drum bands. And that was like a total fun thing to do. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I then moved on to, uh, in the 2000s uh, with the hand pans uh, because several people came to me and said, hey Dave, there's a uh, new instrument. It looks like a flying saucer or a UFO. And you should try making one because I think they look like just like an upside down steel drum. And at the time I was very focused on just making steel drums and steel drums have like a gazillion notes compared to hand pans. And so I was focusing on chromaticism and how many more notes can I put on the instrument. Um, and I just wasn't focused on the hand pan. Uh, so finally another person came along and said, hey Dave, you should try making one of those hand pans. At the time they were calling them hang because the hang is the original uh, name of the instrument that was developed in Switzerland by the uh, company Pan Art. And so they said, you should make a hang. I said, oh, I'll see what I can do. And then finally, um, Teddy and Elias came to me and uh, they said, uh, Dave, we have one. Take a look at it and see if you can make one. So uh, I did what I could and uh, I made one out of a 55 gallon barrel, like a steel drum barrel. And um, that was a lot of fun and I just, inverted it and made one, and when I uh, put it in my lap and played it for the first time, that's when I realized how cool the instrument was. So it took me a while to warm up to the instrument, but after I put it in my lap and, and played it, it made all the sense in the world. Uh, the thing that I thought was uh, really cool about the instrument was that it's a very tactile instrument. Um, the steel drum is very cool, and I'm, uh, I still love it and still play it. It's just a different instrument, uh, but the hand pan, uh, well, steel drum, you play with mallets, so you're kind of separated from the instrument. With the uh, hand pan, you're playing it with your hands, so you can actually feel and touch the instrument. Um, and that's one of the really uh, cool things about it. Um, and you're also feeling the vibrations in your legs and all that sort of thing. Um, so it's very personal, uh, the way uh, it feels and plays uh, while you're playing it. Um, so that's how I got involved with hand pans, and that was about 10 years ago. Uh, about that time, I opened the store here, Dave's Island Instruments, and I started selling um, the original three instruments were steel drums, ukuleles, and then I was just barely making hand pans. And uh, it's interesting how it's all worked out because now hand pans are basically the, uh, the main product we're selling here. We still uh, sell ukuleles and we still sell steel drums and service all of those instruments. Um, so it's a lot of fun what we do here at DII and I thoroughly enjoy what I do. Um, all right, moving on to hand pans. All right, if you see this one here, this is what we call a Luna Clarity hand pan. Um, it's got this nice uh, clear finish on it. Um, let me just quickly show you a couple of these others that we have here. This one is another one that we have. It's called a Luna Satin because it has a satin finish on it. You can see it's a little bit less glossy. And then we've got this here, this new uh, RS model, A-U-R-O-U-S. RS means gold. This is made out of stainless steel. So at DII, all of the hand pans we make, they're all tuned to the same scale. They're made, uh, we tune them to the, what we call the sunset scale. It's a D minor scale. And if you don't know what D minor is, that's fine. Um, and it keeps all the um, instruments uh, in a way where when we have classes, everyone plays together. Um, it's a really approachable scale. When I used to make all sorts of different scales and have them available here at the store, uh, a lot of times people would get a little confused with which one they liked, um, but frequently, I would say 80% of the time, people really liked this scale. So the sunset uh, scale is also called Celtic minor, by the way, out there in the hand pan world. So if you're looking at hand pans, you might have seen the term Celtic minor um, also out there. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of an intro to the instrument. Um, this is there, basically looks like a UFO. It's got a top shell and a bottom shell. Uh, on the bottom, there's a big hole in it, and we call that the goo, G-U, goo, and that term was given to it by the inventors in Switzerland. Um, you can play that and get a bass tone out of it, it's really cool. The bass tone that comes out of it is called a Helmholtz frequency. Um, 
and you can put your hand in it, make it go lower and higher, that sort of thing, by adjusting the diameter of that um, goo hole. On the top, we've got a ding note. So right there, you can see the ding note in the center, D-I-N-G is the way it's spelled. Um, it's basically the bass note of the instrument. It has the lowest sound. Then we've got different notes around the rim of the instrument, and these are called uh, tone field notes. So I've been calling them notes is my way I normally talk about these uh, tone field notes. Uh, but in the handpan community, some people call them tone fields. So I figured I'd just call them tone field notes so that uh, we all know what we're talking about and it all sounds about the same. So this is the ding note, which is also a tone field. We've got uh, tone field notes around the perimeter. The larger ones have a lower sound, and the smaller ones have a higher sound. Um, I can just basically tell you what the note names are um, musically. This is a D, because it's, it's a D minor instrument. This is a D, this is an A, C, D, E, F, G, and A. So, those are the notes. Uh, uh, it's not a complete D minor scale if you're thinking about music. Uh, normally in music, it, between A and C, there would be a B. So alphabetically A, B, C. There would be some kind of B, normally a B flat in a D minor scale. Um, but you don't need to worry about that too much. So let me get started on how to play the instrument. Um, one of the things that most people have trouble with when they are learning how to play is that initial touch. So the initial touch of the instrument is going to be something that you might have a little bit of a challenge with. Some people um, warm up to it really fast, and other people it's more of a struggle. Um, so let me just show you with my finger here. You can see what I'm doing with my finger. I'm basically slapping my hand, and you can kind of hear it slap, right? So what you don't want to do is you don't want to have your finger stay on um, your hand, okay? You want to take that finger and slap it and then come immediately off um, of your hand. And same thing with the hand pan. So if we start with the ding note in the center, you just want to get a nice full sound by hitting it and allowing it to ring by taking your, hitting your finger and just allowing it to come off immediately. try with your left hand. Some people have a harder time with their left hand, uh, but you can just give it a try also. So that's just getting started with some of uh, how to play it. Now, uh, I was using my middle finger just then to give you the example. I just tend to like the way it feels, and I get a good sound out of it. I will occasionally use my index finger as well. I'm actually hitting this uh, note right here uh, on the bottom part of my knuckle, so I'm not using the fatty part of my finger. You can use the fatty part of your finger, but it's going to get a softer sound. You might need to strike it slightly differently, but I like to use that part of my hand. It's kind of a little bit... Um, gives it a, a sharper attack. Um, you can use the other fingers as well. Um, the uh, smaller fingers are obviously going to get a, a lighter sound out of the instrument. something that looks kind of cool, you can use the, the smaller fingers. You can also use your thumbs. Some people prefer to use their thumbs. So if you're going to use your thumb, it's more of a rotary kind of motion uh, with your hand. Or you're going to do that rather than coming down like this. It's kind of a rotary motion. combinations. You can play with your fingers and your thumbs. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but essentially you can stretch your hands out and play one note with one finger and another one with the thumb. So that's always uh, a good thing to, to learn. All right, um, so that's the basics of playing and how to uh, attack the note. So a couple things you uh, kind of want to avoid. Um, uh, there's uh, 
a, a way of playing piano where uh, piano players are taught to curve their fingers. So I've seen people come into the shop and struggle a little bit when they have a curved finger. They're trying to play the instrument kind of with a curved finger and it tends to kind of uh, mute the note when they're playing it because frequently they play with a curved finger and they don't immediately come off of the note. So as you can see, I can, I can still play this with a curved finger, but frequently they, they kind of do a pulling motion, the people that have trouble with this. And when you do that pulling motion, it, you're not doing yourself any favors. So you need to kind of try to get away from that pulling motion and learn how to strike the note and come immediately off of it to get the tone that you want to get. So you can do it to start on the ding note here. Uh, so as an exercise that you could practice at home, you could simply just do um, four or eight hits on each hand um, and alternate back and forth uh, for a duration of time. Um, remember the hand pan, you don't have to play uh, super duper fast or you don't have to play um, uh, music that's like re uh, uses all of the notes. You can relax and it just enjoy the sound of one or two notes and you can still get a lot of, out of the instrument and make it an enjoyable, an enjoyable experience. So uh, just to start, let's just practice on this ding note. Um, the exercise I would suggest is just playing four on a hand. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So you saw what I was doing. I was uh, starting with my right hand, and then I moved to my left hand back to my right hand, went back to my left hand, four strikes on each hand. So another thing I want to point out as I was playing that, I was thinking to myself, Dave, you're going too fast. <laughs> um, with the tempo, tempo means the pace of the music that you're playing. So when you're playing um, notes in succession like that, one, two, three, four, if you count that quickly, the tempo is fast. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, that's a fast tempo. If you, if you say that more slowly, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's a slow tempo. So if I use the word tempo now, you know what I'm talking about. So when I was playing that exercise just then, I felt like I was playing the tempo too fast. Um, for a beginner, you want to do things slowly because it's going to train your body and your muscles uh, how to do it better, more quickly, really. Uh, another thing you want to do is just be regular with your practice. So if you do this, don't expect to get better, better on the uh, first uh, lesson. Uh, give yourself a week. Um, practice every day for, who knows, 15 minutes. Um, and just get that under your belt. Again, I feel like I'm going too fast for beginners. If I was a beginner, you might want to think uh, about um, a clock. Uh, every second that goes by is called 60 beats per minute. So there's 60 seconds in a minute, and there's 60 beats per minute. Uh, BPM is the term that uh, musicians use for uh, a tempo. So if you say 60 BPM, or 60 beats per minute, um, that would be just like every second that goes by on a clock. So if you think of, or look at a clock, or if you have a, some kind of a stopwatch or something like that, you can get a very basic tempo going by just watching the clock. So one, two, three, four, whatever that clock ticking would be, okay? So just to get yourself started and to kind of get yourself into the uh, feel of playing music in tempo, you can just use the click uh, of the second hand on a clock. So let's go a little bit slower here just to kind of get an idea.
understand how the breathing works. Um, by the way, breathing is an important element for percussionists uh, when they when you're learning because if you think about it, people that play flutes or trumpets, uh, any wind instruments, or even singers, when they create music, their breath is limited. So that you can only take so much breath in before your breath uh, expires. And so with percussionists, they tend to forget that, and they play, 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 and they keep going and keep going and keep going. And sometimes it can sound monotonous. Sometimes it's great because you want to keep the rhythm of a song. But if you're playing musically um, with musical shape and musical tones like you find on a hand pan, sometimes you want to give the perception that you're taking a breath, a breath. So, for instance, if you are singing a song, at some point you're going to take a breath and then sing the second verse or the chorus or whatever it is. So when you're playing hand pan, don't forget to take a breath or at least breathe while you're practicing. Um, the space between the notes is also very important. Um, it's not just the notes that you're playing, but the space between the notes matters as well. And it all works together to make the music. So uh, let's move on to uh, some of the other notes. I forgot to mention earlier some of the other parts of the hand pan. We talked about the ding note, we talked about the tone field notes, um, and then you see these little dimples in the middle, these little divots uh, of the, in, in the inside of the notes, in the middle of the notes, and these are called dimples. I just mentioned it. So they, these are gener generally called dimples in the hand pan world. Uh, the top one here, the ding note, this is a big one, silver, and it's pointed outwards. It's still called a dimple, it's just a larger dimple. And I also forgot to mention we've got the rim on it, and this one has a little protective rubber ring on it. Not all hand pans have a uh, rubber ring. Sometimes you might just see a metal ring, or the two uh, hand pan shells are just uh, together and you just see them glued together. Um, all right, so we're gonna move on from our exercise on the ding note. We're gonna move over here to our right hand and our left hand. Uh, we're gonna play the notes on the sides. Now, I forgot to actually mention uh, this is something with a class I probably wouldn't have forgotten, uh, but we need to talk about the orientation. So right now we just played the ding note, which is no big deal because it's right in the middle. The orientation of the hand pan could be any direction, and you can still play that ding note successfully. It's still going to be in the middle. But when you start twisting and turning the hand pan, you're going to notice that the notes, the orientation changes. Okay, so frequently beginners don't know how to position the hand pan initially. So. What you want to do is find the bigger notes. These notes here are about the size of my palm, right? My outstretched hand. The bigger ones are going to be towards your body, and the smaller ones, like this one here, it's only like half the size of my hand, it's usually pointed away from your body. Um, in this case, this one has a total of eight notes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and uh, the eighth one is going to be at the 12 o'clock position. I know I'm backwards from you right now. Maybe I could show it to you like this. So the 12 o'clock position is here, and this is the highest note. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and that's how I get to know where that one goes. The two bottom notes here uh, are at the 5 o'clock and the 5.30 and the 6.30 position. Um, and they're usually the two lowest sounding notes, again, like the size of your hand. Um, and they get progressively smaller. Um, it's harder to do this live on a video to describe this because some people have hand pans that have more than eight notes. They have nine, 10, 11 notes on the top shell. Um, and sometimes the notes are uh, laid out differently on the hand pan. So you can't always guarantee how it's set up. Um, but on our hand pans here at VII, they're all the same scale. So um, once you learn how one is set up, it's pretty easy to orient the rest. Um, so let me get just get started. So the, again, these lower notes here, uh, this one has a lower sound and this one has a higher sound. So you're going to put those two lowest notes towards your body. You're going to take the highest note and put it away from your body at the 12 o'clock position. Okay, so now you're pretty much ready to play. Um, we're going to count these notes too. Um, right now, just to get started, again, like I said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, it's going to start with one, then we're going to have the next lowest is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, when we count it like that, I can now say one, two, three, four. We're going to start with note four on our right hand and note five with my left hand. Okay, so note four here is my a D and note five over here, one, two, three, four, five is going to be my left hand and that's an E. So I'm going to play D and E. 
So as we were working with the exercise earlier on the ding note, striking it four times each, not forgetting to breathe, you can also do that same exercise by splitting up from side to side on the handstand and using different notes. Okay, so we're going to use uh, number four and five, D and E. So the exercise is basically the same. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Again, you're thinking about the clock for tempo. Again, I think I'm going a little bit too fast. Slow it down, make it easy, learn how to go slowly first, and then you can speed it up later. So, as I'm playing that, I was realizing um, that I'm striking the middle of the note. A lot of people have that question, Dave, where do you hit the note? So you see this oval kind of shape here. The oval shape has a long section of the note and a short section from side to side. So the length of the note, um, also by the way, these notes are tuned with three harmonics. So let me just go into that really quick. Each note is tuned with three pitches. So uh, each note has a fundamental pitch, and you don't need to know what these notes, uh, these terms mean exactly right now, but just know that there's three pitches. Uh, there's a fundamental pitch, which is like the lowest sound. Then the octave has an octave tuned to it, and then an octave is like twice as high as the fundamental pitch. And then there's a fifth. The fifth goes through the middle uh, of the note, and that fifth has a higher sound still. So it's sometimes hard to hear, but uh, that's what it is. So what you're trying to do when you're playing just a regular hand pan note, just trying to get started, you will basically strike the center of the note to get the nice fullest sound possible. So you see how my hand is doing that. You can strike it elsewhere, you're just going to get a different sound out of it, which is fine because you're going to learn, need to learn how to do that later as well. But if you want the nice, uh, warmest, fullest sound of the hand pan note, you want to basically strike the center. If you're playing with your thumb, if you try to play towards the center, center of that dimple, your thumb might kind of get uh, stuck in there and not get the optimal sound. So you can actually play right on the edge of that dimple. Play four on the right hand, four on the left hand. Remember, try not to curl your finger. Try to get a nice flat stroke. You also notice that my arm is basically moving like this with gravity, so it's almost falling down with gravity, striking the note and then immediately coming off of the note. slightly either at the same time or slightly before my finger falls on the note. It's almost like it's like a little pivot and uh, it just falls the, and then the finger is like a spring and the finger falls down on the note and springs immediately back up. exercises you can do so far. So you can play four notes on each hand on the ding note. Don't forget to breathe. And then you can switch if you want to split up the exercise. expand on that further, you recall I told you about you could use your thumb and your finger um, together at the same time. So two of the uh, easier notes to hit together um, at the same time are if you just do the exercise I just did, but now use your thumb to play the low A below that. So now you're going to be playing the D and the A together. On your left hand you're going to 
playing the E and the C together. If you want to use numbers, now you're going to be playing 2 and 4 together and 3 and 5 together. Okay? So let's see how that sounds. If you do it four times on each hand, it's going to go like this. by the way, it was not only to show you a little bit better on screen how my hands were shaped, but did you notice that I moved the hand pan from a flat position slightly upward toward my body? So by the way, I'm using a stand right now. We call this the traveler stand down here. Um, it's a nice tripod stand that we use for our hand pans. Uh, what I did is I just moved the hand pan like this so that these notes are a little taller. And so what happens is they're a little bit easier to strike and keep your arm flat. So what you want to avoid is you want to have a sharp angle. Like if you're playing these notes like this, you see that angle that my hand is at right now? That's not ideal because you're going to get a really weird sound out of it and it's going to be uncomfortable. So you're going to try to make it as, a flat, as flat of a position as possible. So like I'm saying, one way I do that is I kind of tilt the hand pan upwards like this. And that way my arm is a little flatter. You'll also notice when I'm playing when I'm using the two uh, fingers, a uh, finger and a thumb, I'm doing a little bit of that rotary motion, twisting my arm slightly. I'm still using my arm and falling down with gravity, but then slightly a little bit of that rotary motion. It's probably going to be a little bit different for everybody that's out there, because everyone's slightly different, hands are different sizes, all sorts of things like that are variables. started. So I just want to give you some little hints along the way. Another thing as we progress, I want you to understand too, uh, that the instrument is not, you can, well, you, I was just going to say, yeah, the instrument's not separate from your body. It is separate from your body, but you can make it part of your body, basically. So instead of thinking of it as a separate entity, think of it as part of you. So well, let's say you have an itch on your toe. What are you going to do with your torso? You're going to move and bend your torso to itch your toe, right? So if you, itched your, if you had an itch on your toe and you stretch your arm out like this, I'm going to itch my toe. Everyone would think you're like crazy because you're like stretching this awkward position to try to stretch your toe because you're imagining your toe is really far away and you're trying to get to it. What you normally do is you bend your body and you move your body towards the position that you need to get to. So same thing with the hand pan. If you are feeling uncomfortable like stretching, go ahead and move your body towards that, or towards that note or towards the position that's most comfortable. Uh, so don't feel like it's something that you need to just do this with and your body stays the same, your body can move around as you play. So for instance, even with this simple exercise, it might be a little bit more easy and comfortable to slightly move from side to side as you're playing those notes. Not necessarily, but I'm just giving you a little hint. Especially when you start moving up towards the top of the instrument, you're going to find that it's a little bit easier if you bend over from time to time. Um, and also, it's kind of fun just to embrace the instrument. So, there you go. Uh, it's a loving and a lo lovable instrument. Um, all right, so we played uh, an exercise on the ding, four uh, strikes on each hand. We worked on the D and the E, uh, numbers five and, or four and five. And we did that, and then we added the low notes. Right? So now, uh, I want to show you a, a little bit of an extended technique, which is going to be kind of fun. Uh, the space between the notes here, you're going to notice on a lot of YouTube videos, uh, the hand pan players play uh, the space between the notes and they get this sharp sound out of it, kind of like a finger click or a snare drum on like a drum set. Um, basically, you're going to slap the space between the notes. That space between the notes officially is called interstitial metal. So the interstitial space or interstitial metal is what you want to find. I tend to like spaces between the notes which kind of form little triangles because it's very separate from uh, the other notes. Um, if you're tapping on a place that's close to a note, you're going to start getting that sound of the note incorporated with the slap that you're creating. So you're going to try to find space that's far away from the notes. So sometimes you'll see players play that slap farther away, close to the rim. Sometimes you'll see them hit it up here. Um, right or left hand, doesn't matter. 
Um, essentially, by the way, so we're talking about the interstitial metal playing that tap. Um, it's almost the opposite technique uh, as playing a hand fan note. Okay, so these tone filled notes, you're trying to get a nice bounce out of your fingers and strike it and bounce immediately off. Right? With the, uh, with the slap, you're going to basically strike it and almost leave your, and, and leave your uh, finger on the metal. I'm actually kind of pushing into it a little bit because I like a nice slappy, uh, sharp sound to it. It is possible just to stri uh, strike it like this and you still kind of get a nice slap out of it. So if you struggle with this, don't worry about it, just switch over. Um, but if you want a nice sharp, uh, full sound from that slap, the ideal way is to slap it and to kind of basically hold it onto the metal like that. So, um, if you want to practice that, you can practice in this little area here on the interstitial metal and this little area here in the interstitial metal. Again, you can do four on each hand. You can see I'm using my middle finger. It's a nice strong finger. Some people might feel more com comfortable with your index finger. If you are, feel free to use your index finger. I've even seen some people use two or three fingers. It starts feeling to me a little bit muddy when I use multiple fingers, so I tend to like just having the strike of one finger only. So, um, but it's kind of up to you to figure out which one feels most comfortable. It's probably most likely it's going to be either the index finger or the middle finger. Okay. Um, now, if you want to incorporate that to make a nice little groove, uh, you can use the ding note in the middle as the bass drum. Pretend like you're playing the drum set in a rock band, and you've got the bass drum, boom, and then you've got the snare drum, which is the high sound, boom, slap, boom, slap, right, which is boom, snare, bass, snare, bass, snare, bass, snare. So what we're going to get started on is we're going to imagine that the ding note is the bass drum, we're going to imagine that the interstitial metal right here is the snare drum. Okay, so a very simple exercise would be uh, going back and forth between the two. We're going to go bass, snare, bass, snare, like this. Okay, so on a very basic level, that's a very simple pattern. Again, if you want to have a tempo to play along to, think about the second hand on a clock. One, two, three, four. That'll get you something started uh, that you can play along to. All right, so to break that up a little bit, you can just go back and forth like that, but I'm going to break it up a little bit. Um, we're going to play uh, this pattern. So just listen to it and tell me in a comment maybe if you know what, uh, if you notice something that's changed. It's just one, two, three, four. But if you have an upbeat between one of those down beats, um, you call it and. So it's going to sound like this. One, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. So you see how that rhythm changes. And then when I start changing the rhythm, I'm using the word and between the one, two, and three, and four. So this is a, a beat that we uh, call the Austin Funk. And I'm going to show you there's a little bit more to it. Um, but after you learn it, it's really fun. It's a great uh, little practice item to practice to get your hands working with the rhythm. Um, it's also, I always say, it's a great uh, song to play uh, for your first gig in a coffee shop. So if you have your first gig in a coffee shop, you can play this and feel comfortable and have a good time, and your friends are going to think you're amazing. All right, so uh, let's practice that one more time. I'm going to show you the little part towards the end that breaks it up a bit. But here's the basic rhythm. This is going to be the one, two, three, and four. We're going to do that three times. One, two, three, stop. Okay, try that one more time. One, two, three, actually stop here. Okay, stop on the ding. So I 
actually you can hit the ding four times. But basically that pattern is three. So let's try it one more time. Ready, play. One. One more time, and then I'm going to show you the little thing that breaks it up. Okay? One more time. Take a breath, relax, enjoy. Here we go. One, two, ready, play. One, two, two, three, stop. Okay? So now the part after this, um, I'm going to show it to you. It goes left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand on the C note and the D note. So at this point, if you have a hand pan that's different than this one, it's not going to be the same unless you know the note names of those uh, pitches or those tone fields. Uh, it needs to be a C and a D. So if you have a different hand pan, you're going to need to find the C, which sounds like this. And you're going to you're gonna need to find a D that sounds like this. In that case, on certain hand pans, I'm going to show you on this one, it's going to go left, right, left, right. So one more time, I'll show it to you here. Got it? On another hand pan, the C and D might be located elsewhere. A C might be here and D might be here. In that case, it's going to be a right, left, right, left pattern. Okay? So just be aware that some hand pans are tuned differently. But if you have this Celtic minor or the sunset hand pan like we have here at DII, it will be a left, right, left, right. So from your perspective, it's going to be left hand, right hand, left hand, and right hand. Okay? So let's just give that a try. Sometimes it starts getting confusing for uh, people when we have our classes here at DII. But just go with it. Um, so I mentioned that it's a C and a D. Don't forget, if we count the, the notes from one, two, three, one, two, three, four. It's going to be notes number three and four, okay? So here we go. Just try this. Try left, right, left, right. That's all we're going to try right now, okay? Ready, play. Left, right, left, right. Reorient yourself if you're having a little struggle or if you're still finding those notes. Give yourself a second. Take a deep breath. And then try it again. Ready, play. So instead of going left, right, left, right, now it's going to go left, right, left, right. Got it? Try that one more time. Ready, play. Left, right, left, right. Good. One more time. Left, right, left, right. Okay, now, I'm going to put it in sequence with the rest. I want you to listen to it, and then we're going to try practicing, practicing it together. Okay, here it goes. Here's the whole pattern. for people to learn it is just to raise your hands a little bit. So when you see me raising my hands, I'm just doing that to kind of show you. Pause, don't keep playing, because some people get confused with that. So one more time, let's hear it the whole way through. I'm going to play it twice through. Raise my hand. 
hand, so emphasize where that rest was. All right, I think maybe you have it now. Let's see if we can play it together. Let's try four times through, just for some fun, and I'll see where it goes. One, two, ready, play. So that's a really fun exercise to play, a little first song, uh, if you want to say. Um, so just let me review really quick. So we started out with the ding note. We talked about how to strike the note. Uh, you can use any of your fingers, uh, but predominantly it's going to be one of the stronger fingers, either the index finger or the middle finger. Uh, I tend to use the bottom part of my knuckle to strike the notes. On the ding note here, um, I strike the bottom part of my knuckle right on the top of that dimple. On the side notes, I basically take my finger and it goes towards the middle of each one of those dimples to get a nice full sound out of it. If you want to use your index finger, that's fine. If you want to use your middle finger, that's fine. If you want to use one of your smaller fingers, you can do that too, but you're going to start getting lighter and lighter sounds out of it, which is kind of fine for uh, special effects. It's kind of fun. Uh, you can also use your thumb. A lot of people prefer their thumb. You're either going to be comfortable with that immediately or you're going to need some practice. You can do all of these exercises I talked about uh, using your thumb if you want to use your thumb rather than your fingers. Uh, if you're using your thumb on the tone field notes on the side, you're going to basically be striking towards the edge of these dimples, not so much in the middle. Okay, so we started out playing four beats on each hand on the ding note. One, two, Positions one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, five. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Okay? We also added our thumb in, so you're playing two notes at the same time. I talked about orienting your hand pan in a way where it's comfortable. So I'm going to lift this hand pan up a little bit, make it so my arms are kind of flat. They're falling down with gravity so that you're not angling your wrist like this because that's an uncomfortable position. You want to have a nice, comfortable position when you play. to kind of get you started with just playing the hand pan and getting some sounds out of the hand pan. Uh, then we talked about playing our first song, the Austin Funk. Uh, it sounds like this. Thank you. 
All right, I think I'm going to leave it there for this lesson. Uh, I, we explored a lot of different options for you to get started on the handpan. You might have noticed that we didn't even touch these top notes up here at the top of the handpan. We didn't even get to those yet. Um, we can talk about that in the next lesson. So I think this was a lot to work on just for you at home to kind of start relaxing and enjoying the handpan. Again, you don't need necessarily to play a lot of things on the handpan to make yourself uh, enjoy the instrument. Some of these exercises might sound a little bit rudimentary. So if you want to, you could just explore those rather than playing four on each hand. You could play four here and one here, four here and one here, or one here and four there, and one here and four there, or two, 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 or one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. Whatever you want to do, kind of explore those options. And you can create your own music from it. Um, I'm going to explore, I think, the next time uh, some scales so we can practice the scales going up and down. You'll get familiar with that. Um, other than that, I'm glad you tuned in. Uh, I want to make sure that you have uh, awareness that we are going to be having online subscriptions coming up. So, uh, subscription meaning subscription lessons. Uh, we've already created some subscription lessons and we are editing them and putting them together. So in the future, uh, check in with us uh, on our website or give us a call or email and uh, let us know if you're interested in that. Um, so those are coming up. Uh, we also have a virtual tip jar coming up. So you see this little tip jar right here? This is a free lesson. But if you feel like giving us a nice virtual tip one of these days, you can put a little drop of money in there. We're gonna get it set up soon and that'd be fun. Uh, let's see, we also have some upcoming classes. So we're gonna be doing ukulele classes more handpan classes, and we're also going to be doing steel drum lessons. Uh, Daniel is going to be playing uh, or teaching the uh, ukulele classes. Greg is going to be teaching the steel drum classes, and I'm going to be continuing with the handpan courses and the classes and having fun out there with you a little bit more into the future. Um, don't forget our online store, our website is still open for business. If you need to get a rental handpan or if you want to buy a handpan, uh, we can still do business through our website even though our store is currently closed. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, I don't know if you did. You, anybody have any final questions or comments? Cleaning. Oh, cleaning. Oh, cleaning. Okay. Charles is asking how to clean. All right, all right cleaning. That's thanks, what I, thanks, Charles. Charles, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> all right, so this is a Clarity hand pan, and uh, the Clarity is a, a finish that's a powder coated and has really bonded strong onto the instrument. Uh, it's very durable. Uh, it, you just don't want to scratch it with a hard cloth. So you want to make sure. That, yeah, I don't have a cloth here. But a nice soft cotton cloth um, is ideal. Uh, if you want to disinfect it, I've already shown uh, on a different video of how to clean them with a, one of these little wipes, uh, one of these disinfectant wipes. Oh, here's a little towel right here. So this is a nice cotton cloth. You could uh, either spritz uh, the clarity with uh, just even water and wipe it off with a soft cloth, cotton cloth. Or if you want, if it's feeling greasy, you can use some Windex or something like that and wipe off the greasy feel with uh, Windex and a simple cotton cloth. The same thing goes for our satin finish hand pans, satin finishes. All you really need to do is spritz some water on there or some uh, Windex or glass cleaner. Just wipe it off with a soft cloth and you'll be fine. Uh, the Aris stainless steel, this one here um, might require some, a slightly different technique. Um, I've been able to disinfect them easily with the wipes, uh, but the wipe will also wipe off any kind of uh, stainless steel cleaner that I put on it. So at the store, you can just go to a store or order it on Amazon. It's just regular old stainless steel cleaner. Um, and I had a spray bottle, and sometimes they come in wipe form also. Um, you can just wipe it on uh, or spray it on if it's a spray, and just wipe it off with your cotton cloth again, and that'll help the stainless steel uh, looking good and keep a any kind of water or moisture off of it. Um, so that's how you clean them. If you want to uh, disinfect any of them, uh, we did a video on that earlier, and I tried out um, alcohol, I tried out um, a, uh, like a Lysol spray, and I tried out the wipes. You know, I preferred the wipes, the alcohol, for the, uh, the spray that I used, the Lysol spray. It tended to leave like little drip marks and stains on the metal, so I tended not to like that or want to use that. So I used the Clorox wipes or any kind of disinfecting wipe that's out there. Um, let's see, if you have a nitrided hand pan uh, that has a nitrided metal, um, sometimes people will use a product called frog lube on that metal to keep it from rusting. Um, so if you're doing that, I didn't actually uh, prepare a pan with frog lube on it to, to wipe it clean or put any kind of disinfectant on it. So you just need to make sure with all of these products 
that you um, try a small spot first. Don't just wipe it all over the whole thing and think that it's going to be uh, working properly the first time. Use a small spot, maybe on the rim, like over here, take off the rubber ring. Just put it on the rim or on the bottom shell, just spray a little bit on. And you might want to let it sit there for a little while too. Don't just spray it on and wipe it off because sometimes that'll work the first time, but the product might start seeping into the material um, and cause problems if it, lets, if it sits there for five or 10 minutes. So just be careful of uh, whatever products you put on your hand pan, ch check small spots first. Um, but our product, basically, if you need to clean anything here at DI, all, all of our hand pans are, can be easily um, cleaned with Windex or water. And then, like I said, with the RS uh, hand pan, you can use the stainless steel cleaner. Chad is asking, what is the rubber ring that people put in the goo? Oh, Chad is asking, what is the rubber ring that people put in the goo? Okay, so this is the goo hole. We talked about that a little bit at the beginning of the video. Um, sometimes there might be a little bit of a rubber ring in there. It's probably just to keep your uh, fingers from getting scratched by the metal that's in there. Um, if it starts coming out, just put it back. It shouldn't be that big of an issue. Um, some people like the way the metal rings on the bottom of the hand pan. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, that ring uh, sometimes can be inhibited by like a little rubber ring. So if you want to have it more ringing, maybe you can take it off, make sure you put it back on. Um, I can't guarantee that that metal is sharp or not sharp. So like I said, sometimes they put it on there to protect it, your hand from getting cut, basically. So just make sure that it's not going to hurt your finger uh, or your fingers when you lift up the hand pan or reach in there. And if you do take off that little rubber ring. Um, here at DII, we've got a little thing called a goo booster. Um, and the goo booster is made of plastic. And we put it into the bottom of our hand pans here. And it basically tunes it. So right now when it's... Uh, uh, open like this, it's basically like an F natural pitch that comes out of here, like a bass tone with an F. You put this in there and it becomes a D, and it matches basically the D that's on top. So you can't really hear it on the video, but if you're in a nice uh, resonant room, or if you have a microphone, it has this really beautiful bass tone that comes out of the bottom. So I like having the ability to change that, to turn it on or off when I want it. So I like to put the uh, goo booster in there sometimes uh, just to give it an excellent, a nice resonance sound. So that's one thing we do here at DII that not a lot of other people do. Um, so I enjoy it though. So if you're interested in getting a goo booster, let us know. It doesn't always fit other hand pans. Um, everyone's, uh, the diameter of the holes can change, uh, the goo holes. So we'll do our best, but it definitely fits our clarity and definitely fits our uh, satin models. So, all right, I'm gonna sign off now, and uh, I'm glad that you, uh, oh yeah, I'll play a little bit. I'm glad that you were here. Um, I hope you can do okay at home, hanging out there on your own, uh, social distancing like we're all doing, and uh, that's it. So I'm gonna play a little bit and let you go. All right, have a great day.